Please have a seat and keep your Bibles open or open them again uh, back up to uh, Colossians chapter 2, which we're looking at this morning. Um, and uh, I was, I guess, reminded by how cold it is this morning about a time uh, in high school when I was learning the piano and I didn't get very far, by the way, in that, but I did. And uh, my high school, uh, my piano teacher enrolled me in this Steadford thing, which it's a lot of laughter there, which is probably fair. Um, but went to this at Stedford and I'd never been to one before. It's not something I normally did. So I practiced my piece and I thought, this is great. I'm an Stedford pianist now. So I went to the um, hall and so I got there sort of towards when the thing was starting. And then I got there and I was just like, oh my word, everyone was already there, like sort of all kind of ready, warming their fingers up and they all had hot water bottles to keep their fingers warm and nimble. You know, and so I walked in and I just, I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is not, this, I'm, I don't think I'm doing this right. I thought, I, I've done my practice, but this isn't, this isn't, I'm probably not supposed to be here. That, that's how I felt. I don't know if you've ever felt that in any situation where you say, maybe I'm not sp supposed to be here after all. I don't know if you've ever felt that as a, a Christian ever, when you sort of think, am I, am I doing this right? Is this how it's supposed to be? When you've looked around at other people, um, or even when you look at yourself compared to how uh, you think you should be living your Christian life. I wonder if you've ever thought, am I, am I doing this right? I mean, this letter, Paul uh, wants these Colossians, as we've heard, to continue in the faith, established and firm. That's what we heard in chapter 1. Um, and to continue to live uh, with Christ Jesus as Lord, just as they received him. That, that was the, the first part of chapter 2. And so today, um, our passage is about... Well, you know, at those times when we might wonder, am I doing this right? When we might think, you know, have I missed something? How at those times, being in Christ Jesus and staying rooted in Him is the only thing that matters for doing the Christian life right. That's what we're looking at today. And as uh, we start, this first part we're going to look at is a bit like a pep talk before the big game, before we get into kind of the specifics of religion and spiritual experience and how rules could knock us off course. This first part is like a, a pep talk, but it's, it's entirely true. Uh, it's meant to kind of blow our minds about who Jesus is and help us be kind of awed and thankful for him and encourage us that if we trust uh, in him, that's all we need. So this first point uh, is that we've got it all in Jesus. Um, look how he's described in those first uh, verses of our reading. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus Christ, that human being born, you know, 2,000 years ago, is God himself. And we sang that song, only a holy God. You know, come and behold him, the one and the only. That God lives in Jesus in bodily form. In Jesus is all God's fullness. There's no other part of God that you can find, you know, somewhere else. Which means if you're looking at Jesus, then you are truly looking at God. You don't have to look anywhere else. In fact, it means if you are looking anywhere else to find God, you're not going to find him. You need to look at Jesus. And of course, that makes Jesus the head over every power and authority, uh, as it says there. And then we go on to perhaps this even more amazing thing that in Christ it says you have been brought to fullness in Christ you have been brought to fullness now this idea of being in Christ is really important uh, this is I guess how it works if you receive Christ Jesus as Lord that's the the language of last week if you trust him then that trust connects you to him in an amazing way in a way that means that he represents us what happens to him happens to us it's like if you sign up for a membership at your chosen sports club perhaps the new south wales swifts i don't know if anyone is into the swifts but if you if you pay your membership and sign up uh you are now part of that club and though you never get on the court though you don't ever shoot any goals though you don't play at all if your team wins you win if your team loses you lose now look at what Jesus is shooting for us. Look at the goals he's shooting for us. It says, in him, you were also circumcised. Okay, that's, that's a weird thing to hear at this point. That's a, quite a weird thing to hear. Circumcision, the removal of a bit of uh, the foreskin, 
was a sign uh, that you might know was given to God's people in the Old Testament as a marker for them being different to other people. And there was, I guess, this symbolism of a little bit being kind of cut off. Uh, It was showing that actually, well, we need surgery as humans to be in, in right relationship with God. And of course, that was only a symbol. You probably heard in our first reading um, about uh, Moses imploring the people to circumcise their hearts. Uh, so our, you know, our penchant for ignoring God, that is a, a spiritual problem, a deep spiritual problem. And so what's this saying about us being circumcised? Well, look, it says we're circumcised in Him. We're included in Jesus' circumcision. Now, Jesus as a good Jewish baby would have been circumcised on the eighth day as Jewish male babies were. Um, Is that what this is talking about? No, it's talking about something bigger. Christ underwent the thing that circumcision was pointing to, the cutting off of the sinful self as he died. When Christ was circumcised, i.e. killed, cut off, then if you're in Christ, you were too. And this idea that circumcision represents death, it makes sense as we go on in that sentence. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him. Right? Baptism is a thing that Christians do to represent being joined to Christ. It too represents death as you uh, go under the water or have water poured on you. And a, it represents a burial and then a rising as you come out again. It points to how a Christian is connected to Jesus himself in those things, that what he's done, you've actually participated in. Right, so that's the first little part of this pep talk, right? That you are truly in Christ and to be in him means that amazingly you're connected with him in your dying and rising again. Isn't, isn't that great? It's, it's like, it's a strange concept to think you are connected with Jesus in that way. But when you, when you think about it, it should make us excited and thankful. Uh, but th- there's more, because um, he kind of goes on. Here's what being in Jesus means. These are the implications. Have a look at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. All right, so you're spiritually dead if you're not connected to the source of life. Kind of like a, a cut flower in a vase. You can't really describe it as living, even though it kind of looks like it is. Uh, even if you do add the special florist nutrients, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go in a few days' time. Dead in your sins, it says. It's our, our sin, our rejection of God in how we think and act that cuts us off from the source of life. It's like we start out as flowers connected to a plant and the plant says, stay connected to me, keep growing. And then almost to spite the plant, we, well, this doesn't really work because flowers don't have hands, but we somehow grab the scissors and cut ourselves off from the plant to be free or or not really that free but in Christ God makes it possible to be made alive again by forgiving our sins and uh, you can see there this term uh, this that we have this charge of our legal indebtedness it's like a, a spiritual kind of IOU think of that a document that notes down on it all the ways that that you have done God wrong Think of that document, it's just growing. Think of the things that you've added to it uh, this week, this morning. Failure to do things, doing things uh, that we shouldn't, thinking things, ignoring him. It's not really the kind of document that you'd want sort of framed on your wall. You'd want to bury it and have no one ever see it, but you know that it exists. It's this IOU that is impossible to pay back. And it comes with, I guess, a penalty attached uh, that says what happens, well, what happens if you can't pay it back? And the penalty is death. But then do you see what he does to it? He nails that IOU to the cross. There it is, not just mine, but yours, yours, all, you know, all of our IOUs nailed to the cross above Jesus, above the fullness of the deity as he dies. The penalty for our indebtedness. The IOUs are paid in full. Though, though that death may look like the powers of this world triumphing over, triumphing over Christ, it's actually the complete opposite. So if you're in Christ, then that's true of you. You've been made alive again. You've got it all. Your life, complete forgiveness, fullness. That's what we're told, even if we don't quite understand that completely. 
for those of us who are in him, this is a reality that we need to understand and go deeper in and embrace. And for those uh, who might be here today who aren't in him, who haven't received Christ Jesus as Lord, well, you need to be in him. You need to be in him or you're like this cut flower, right? You're like a flower that uh, is dead. Uh, because if you're in Christ, you've got it all. So that's kind of the pep talk. If you're in Christ, you've got the fullness of God, you've got it all. Now, let's get into how that helps us in our Christian life. In this second half of the passage, uh, situations when you need to know that so truly, you need to know that you've got it all in Jesus. First situation, you need to know you've got it all in Jesus when you're judged on religion. Do you ever feel uh, sometimes, like I was talking at the beginning, that you're less of a Christian, that... Uh, I don't know, maybe you're not doing it right because of how you do or don't do certain things sometimes. Maybe, for instance, you're not much of a, a prayer out loud. Or maybe you judge yourself on how well you're going with Jesus on how you do certain things. You, you know, you pat yourself on the back because you think, hey, I turned up to church this week. I must be going really well with Jesus. Have a look at, at verse 16 there. It says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Uh, the practices Paul mentions there are, are Jewish practices, and most of these Colossians weren't Jewish, and so the question would have come, okay, so should we live with the rules that God gave to his people pre-Jesus? Is that what this looks like? And the answer is, well, it, it really doesn't matter. Because these practices, he goes on, says they're just like, a, they're a shadow as opposed to the substance, the real thing. They're not the same as the thing that casts the shadow. They sort of show you the shape of something that's true. They point to, to, to Christ. So what really matters is uh, if you're in Christ, if you are, then there's no religious practice that you, you can do that makes you better or worse with him. You're already full. No kind of religious practice can be anything more than a shadow. It just, it points, in, in the best case, to Jesus. What you do or don't do uh, with the shadows tells you nothing of your relationship to the substance. And so that also means that you don't find your security in the shadow either. Let's um, think about an example of religious practice today, um, here in 2023. We've got a religious practice of, of coming to church each Sunday. And we've actually, we've set a goal to come to church 80% of the time this year um, at Warunga Anglican. But what does this passage say about that? Here are some, I guess, some things to consider as you think about uh, committing to coming to church each Sunday. Firstly, your relationship with God is not dependent on your success or failure to actually to do that. To root how well your relationship uh, with, with Jesus is going on, on the practice of just coming to church on Sundays, that's to root it on your own strength rather than on his strength. So don't be fooled, I guess, into thinking, oh, just, you know, coming to church on Sundays, that's, that equals my relationship with Jesus. So you might think, oh, okay, then, well, maybe I won't commit myself to coming to church on Sundays. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I do have to say something else now. Um, <laughs> Because on the other hand, your relationship with God is not strengthened by you expressing freedom from a religious practice either. Paul's not saying that the answer to avoiding, you know, having false security in uh, religion is by simply concluding that what you do doesn't matter. The reality is, actually, you not being here on a Sunday, that doesn't strengthen your relationship with Jesus at all. So to root your relationship... In, uh, with Jesus in the opposite, in the freedom from religious practice, well, that's to root your relationship with Jesus on, on something else instead. Perhaps it's a past connection to Jesus. If you're not regularly strengthening your life in Jesus and having brothers and sisters uh, proclaim him to you, then your life won't be feeding on anything to do with Christ. It will feed on, well, I guess, probably whatever else you fill that void with. Um, whether it's career or family or leisure or hobbies or children. See, the way to stand firm in Jesus is not just to avoid 
the shadows of religion and instead embrace the shadows of the world. It's by planting your root system in Jesus. So you need to know you've got it all in Jesus when you're, when you're judged on religion. You need to know you've got it all in Jesus when you're dismissed because of experience. Have a look at verse 18. It says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Here the issue is someone disqualifying you because of their, their religious uh, spiritual experience. Look at what's listed there. You've got first a kind of humility that's not really that humble at all, a kind of perhaps self-denial that ends up in making you feel hopelessly inferior. Maybe it's expressed as sort of never uh, indulging in uh, unspiritual things, such as enjoying yourself or enjoying uh, rest. Something that might appear spiritual from the outside. Uh, sometimes when you see someone like that, though, it's, it's quite easy to think, maybe I'm a, I'm a second-rate Christian here. Or uh, it says, uh, worship of angels. Whatever exactly that phrase means, it's a kind of worship, a kind of spirituality that's in some way intimidating. Uh, you might look at that kind of experience, that kind of approach, and you might think, oh, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here. You might think, well, uh, that your low-key way of, I guess, just trying to trust Jesus more, trying to love his people, you might think, oh, it's a bit, bit lame. Or there, you've got someone who's going into great detail about what they have seen. Uh, you might have met Christians before who've um, uh, seen a vision or uh, uh, dreams or heard voices or heard, uh, had inner convictions, uh, or at least who say they have. And there's nothing to say those things can't happen, but lots of Christians just haven't experienced those things. When you hear about those things, you might think, well, there's something wrong with me as a Christian. But Paul's saying here, don't be disqualified by such people. Don't feel that you're second rate at that point. What matters is that you're in Christ. You've got it all in Jesus. Or perhaps you get your security and your, uh, about your trust in Jesus from experiences that you've had in the past. The issue is that with these kinds of experiences, they can lead a person to becoming well, puffed up Verse 18, it says they're arrogant. These kinds of experiences might make someone think that they're better uh, than, than other people. You might think that that's what their relationship with Jesus depends on. But actually, that's, that's, that's all in their heads. And it, that's the problem. They're, their head. Because uh, you can see there, the risk in verse 19 is that uh, someone like this has lost connection with the head with Jesus. It's not that a disciplined life is wrong, it's not that deep worship are, is wrong or visions or any of these things, but it is an issue when it becomes disconnected from the head, from Jesus. And so you need to know you've got it all in Jesus when you're proud because of experience as well. And finally, you need to know you've got it all in Jesus when you're tempted towards uh, legalism, uh, rule following, living your Christian life on a set of rules. Now, I like rules because they make life simpler, right? More manageable, easier. If you know which socks you're going to wear on Monday, that saves time. And while rules in uh, the Christian life uh, can be very helpful, there's a risk if they're given too much power. So have a look um, here at why living with rules as your ruler is fruitless. There are two reasons. First, they operate in just a very limited sphere. Have a look at verses 20 and 21. Um, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Those most likely refer to uh, Jewish rules, but the point seems to be that they're to do with the world. Right? Uh, Christians, verse 20 says, pardon me, have died in Christ to elemental spiritual forces of the world. The key part of that phrase being of this world. These rules have no power to make someone more or less pleasing to God if they've already died to the world in Christ. Or look in verse 22. The rules, it says, have to do with things that are destined to perish with use. That is, they really only pertain to uh, the external, physical world. Uh, or it says there they are based just on human commands and teachings. See, they operate in this limited sphere. They might have value in this sphere, but... They can't get close to doing what Christ has already done for you. 
nonetheless, following rules is a, is a real tempting way to relate to God. Perhaps not Jewish rules for us, but our own rules. We probably wouldn't say that out loud, but I think our hearts are tempted in that direction. They're tangible, graspable rules. That's, that's quite uh, uh, an attractive way to live. And they may actually have the appearance of wisdom, as it says in verse 23. Following some rules can give you a, a look of godliness. And in fact, it may even fool you into thinking that about yourself. Or you might say, all right, I'm going to do a 15-minute quiet time. Every day I'm going to pray and read the Bible. I'm going to read through the Bible um, in a year, in 20 minutes with Tony Jones or even less than that. Uh, you might say, look, I'm going to make this rule. And that's, that's a good rule. Those rules are good rules. And at, you may appear very godly. I mean, I don't know how people would know. Maybe you talk about it, people look in through your window. Who knows? But you may appear godly to people or you may appear godly to yourself. You may go well with it. And in that case, you might feel great about yourself. My relationship with God is going so great because I'm just so good at keeping this rule. Or you may go poorly and feel really horrible about yourself and your relationship with Jesus. But just following that rule doesn't mean you're better off with God. You've already got it all in Jesus. Before you even make that commitment, a quiet time is really valuable in as much as it points you to him more and more. But here's the second thing about rules. They're not actually effective at bringing heart change. Paul is certainly not against rules uh, and he'll give a whole lot of directions in the next chapter as we look at that next week. But every rule, even wise Christ-based rules, they can't change us. They can't restrain sensual indulgence in verse 23 there. Underneath it all is the issue of our own self-indulgence, our self-love and so on. And so what you need is not restraint, but is to go deeper into Jesus, rooted in him. So you could technically follow your quiet time rule every day, but you could be filled with frustration and anger as you do that, wishing that you weren't doing that, wishing that you were somewhere else. You could be distracted as you read. It's a wise rule, yes, because the point of it is to scaffold you to know Jesus more, but it in itself can't change you. Only Jesus can. So, listen to that pep talk. Stay rooted in Jesus because we've got it all in Him. That is a truly great relief to recognise more and more. We need to grow in the knowledge that He is truly enough. So we're not knocked off course by what other people might think of us. We don't find our security in how godly we think we are. And when we're feeling judged on religion or dismissed because of experience, or when we're tempted just to follow rules, we can have confidence and assurance and hope that if we're in Jesus, we are indeed as full as we can be. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Let's pray. Father, um, thank you so much for Jesus and for uh, all your fullness in him. Thank you that we can be united to him and for all the benefits that that brings to us. Lord, help us in our minds and in our hearts stay rooted in him. Amen.